the story. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you make of this? asked the archaeologist. Carhenge, isn't it? said the science fiction writer. Well, it looks like the ideal opening slide for talk about science fiction at an archaeology conference. <laughs> a fusion of 20th century technology and Neolithic cosmology. A culture crash, to coin a phrase. Oh, I wish I thought of that when I submitted my title, replied the archaeologist. <laughs> I, I wrote about it as, here we are, an image of modernity reconfigured as something other, which seems to materialise the dreamlike logic of J.G. Ballard's protagonists in novels like Crash. The writer raised an eyebrow. OK, I know that sounds a bit pretentious, but I've always admired authors with the ability to recast the familiar in a different guise. As a prehistorian, one of my objectives is to present the people of the remote past in all of their humanity and all of their difference. Because if we don't show that prehistoric people were like us, how can we counter the caveman stereotypes? And if we don't show that society was different in the past, how can we make the case that it could be different in the future? The writer smiled again. Or, as Ian Sinclair said, when in doubt, quote Ballard. <laughs> well, I am in doubt, said the archaeologist. I wasn't happy with the first draft of this paper. It was too fragmentary. It didn't seem focused enough for an authoritative delivery. So I threw it away and rewrote it as a dialogue with you. Thanks, said the writer. Let's see how credible you make me. So let's talk. I think you have a point. One critic wrote that it's by imagining strange worlds that we come to see our own conditions of life in a new and potentially revolutionary perspective. Fine words from science fiction, though I'm not sure that it's ever really changed anything. How about archaeology? We keep trying, and I think making these connections is part of it. So do you think there's a shared project here between the archaeology of the past and, to quote Jameson, the archaeologies of the future? I didn't spot much actual archaeology in Jameson. Really, he's excavating the foundations of the utopian urge in science fiction. True, though I thought he said some interesting things about, for example, historical narratives, temporality and causality. But this paper I'm trying to write is kind of the mirror image of his analysis of future utopias, how we might draw the future back into the past. But why is a prehistorian like you interested in science fiction texts, asked the writer. I'm sure there's all sorts of stuff written about narrative forms by archaeologists. Mm, perhaps not as much as you might think, said the archaeologist. We're quite wedded to our traditional reports. But one key text is Rosemary Joyce's Languages of Archaeology, which talks about how, in self-consciously attempting to tell stories, archaeologists enter the terrain of fiction writers, though she doesn't discuss genres like SF. So I wanted to talk to someone like you, because I thought that the professional imagineers the writers of science fiction might offer some insights into how to write about the otherness of the past. After all, didn't Darko Subin define SF as the literature of cognitive estrangement? That sounds like what I want to achieve with a prehistoric narrative, finding new ways of conceiving past worlds. It's true there's some connections between science fiction and archaeology, replied the writer. Robert Silverberg, has written about real archaeology as well as fictional alternate pasts. Look, Romans in space. <laughs> hmm. I'm not really sure you SF writers have written that well about archaeologists. How about this one? Although it does make the important point that if you dig up a black hole, there might be significant conservation issues. <laughs> anyway, I, I wanted to look beyond the immediately referential stuff to see what we can learn from the wider span of the genre. Good, said the writer. Been to the movies lately. Yeah, Arrival was terrific, wasn't it? And this review kind of makes my point, but I'm sure other people at the conference will be talking about film and TV, so I'm sticking to books. Well, it's all about intertextuality these days, said the writer, but OK, I'll try and help. There's a lot of areas where what we do might connect with archaeological narratives. We like world building, don't we? Although. Sometimes that element of science fiction appears to be at the expense of things like character and plot, doesn't it? Said the archaeologist. Sure, but I'm with Ursula Le Guin. Simply listing the marvels and wonders lacks moral resonance without a novelistic subject. I guess you're right, and we prehistorians do find ourselves in a similar situation. We can't deny that imagination plays a role in our reconstructions of the past, and that mere description is insufficient for a moral engagement with the past. And how about time, said the writer. We often deal with deep time too. I thought you might like this. 
the protagonist travels back to the Pleistocene and gets pretty intimate with Homo habilis. <laughs> Let's leave that one there, said the archaeologist. But time, time, travel time travel stories do seem to engage with key questions of causality and agency. Can an individual change the past or the future? And is it desirable to do so? What kind of changes might lead to an alternate present? Thirdly, continued the writer, technology. Your stories start by digging up material culture, don't they? SF is often like that too, extrapolating the effects of particular technologies or events on society. Try any Arthur C. Clarke. We're often far more interested in artifacts than in people, and we look to the past for guidance about the effects of technological change. It's the past is an endlessly bountiful museum for us, as Gwyneth Jones puts it. But this is all getting very serious. Let's not forget that SF should be fun too. Can you say the same about your stuff? The archaeologist didn't look very amused. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about horrible histories. But I, I admit the thrill of sci-fi is that sense of wonder, and it would be great to capture some of that in our texts. I think there are other parallels between archaeology and SF, though. I always had this idea that, like archaeological theory, science fiction falls into different camps. And perhaps that means there are some correlations in our attempts to make sense of the past and the future. What do you mean, said the writer? Well, for example, I can see analogies between processual archaeology and the classic hard science fiction. It conforms rigorously to its own rules. It's more interested in plot and technology than character and motive. It's often politically conservative, and it's mostly written by white American men with beards. <laughs> <laughs> and then, can we equate the new wave with post-processual archaeology? It's self-consciously playful, including with the rules of the genre interested in meaning, symbolism, and inner worlds. It's often political, politically radical, started in Britain, and although it's still mostly written by white men with beards, it was a little bit more diverse. And then finally, is cyberpunk, with its emphasis on the cyborg and the hybrid, in, have a parallel with the Leturian material turn in, in archaeology? Um, I should say Deleuzean. By the way, I love how the first line of Neuromancer immediately throws you into a technological landscape Though given that no one actually tunes a TV anymore, it all now seems a little bit nostalgic. I think that's a bit simplistic, said the writer, but um, shouldn't you get on with the actual topic of your paper? The archaeologist glared. I just wanted to suggest that we both respond to the same cultural currents. But okay, so what can we learn from science fiction about how to convey the otherness of the past, how to write about our strangers in their strange lands? You could try Donna Haraway, said the writer, who wrote that science fiction is generically concerned with the interpretation of boundaries between problematic selves and unexpected others. A bit like us two, the archaeologist interjected. The writer ignored that, but there are different ways of writing otherness. Greg Benford distinguished the anthropocentric alien that serves primarily as a mirror for us, a way to examine our problems in a different light, from the unknowable alien. Um, but that's fine, because your aliens may be a long way off in time, but they're firmly terrestrial, aren't they? And at the same time, don't forget that otherness itself is a tricky concept, because othering is also a technique of repression. Aliens are literally alienated. Certainly not all science fiction is good at alterity or otherness. Ursula Le Guin has critiqued all those galactic empires taken straight from the British Empire of the 1880s, and the othering of aliens in classic Orientalist mode so they become either very threatening or very wise, Vader and Yoda. What good science fiction does is provide a vision of alienness or otherness without resorting to archetypes and stereotypes, or it subverts them. Even H.G. Wells did that right at the start of modern SF in The War of the Worlds, putting Europeans from the Age of Empire in the position of the colonized natives. The Martians are the frightful other, but they also stand for us. It's interesting, said the archaeologist. I suppose the goal for us prehistorians is the creative tension between otherness and familiarity. We can empathise with people of the past and their practices while also appreciating our conceptual differences from them. OK, so shall we discuss how science fiction writers create otherness, said the writer? Or have you run out of time already? We should certainly get on with it, said the archaeologist. I wanted to read some extracts of relevant texts, but I'm not sure I've got time after these digressions. I suppose you could just put a few quotes on the slides, said the writer, and then the audience can decide whether to read them or listen to you. It shouldn't be too difficult a choice. But okay, let's start with this, the classic alien encounter. 
from what I've read, I can see this ranges from the explicitly anthropological, as in Michael Bishop's Transfigurations, where the first part spoofs an ethnographic field report, to the deliberately incomprehensible, like the overmind in Clark's Childhood's End, which converts human children into this strange trans-individual being that makes rivers flow uphill. But in your case, it's the negotiation between worldviews that you're interested in, isn't it? Asked the writer. So what about, say, Gwyneth Jones using the alien encounter to throw into question ideas of gender identity, or, if you're not so keen on alien sex, communication? Are they really telepathic, or do they just think they are? And then there's Ian M. Banks, addressing the meeting of very different temporalities with his ideas about quick and slow races and the enigmatic dwellers who live on the giant gas planets. But the writer continued, don't get too obsessed with aliens. There are more ways of creating that sense of otherness you're after. You could look at the future's take on the present as an analogy for how we, or rather you, might misunderstand the past. Think of the uh, pre-apocalyptic ephemera fetishized by the church in a canticle for Leibovitz, the monks carefully illuminating the blueprints of the fallout shelter it seems to challenge our assumptions about the perceived value of objects. And then there's Gene Wolfe, his Severian's unsettling description of the picture of an ancient astronaut in the Book of the New Sun, an artifact literally out of time. By the way, I love the way that book presents remnants of the lost technology of their past, our future, as something akin to magic. It's SF written in the guise of fantasy and myth. But perhaps also for you, it has something interesting to say about the role of technology. Sure, said the archaeologist, I think I've heard that one somewhere before. But it's not just the time gap. You can also unsettle the present, the everyday through different perceptual lenses, and call into question the meanings of daily life. Brian Aldis did this in Probability A, where he has this utterly mundane scenario, like the kettle boiling, observed in excruciating detail by observers who are in turn watched by other watchers reading far too much into it all for inexplicable reasons, though I'm sure you archaeologists never do that. <laughs> Another raised eyebrow. And then there's J.G. Ballard again. Take his short story, The Enormous Space. Like a lot of Ballard, it draws parallels between social and psychological breakdown, and you can compare that to The Drought and other early novels where it's the environmental breakdown that's reflected in the mind of the protagonist or perhaps caused by it. How do humans really relate to their environment? Anyway, in this case, domestic space has never been so weird, and neither has living in Croydon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm from Croydon, said the archaeologist. It, it may have changed since I lived there. But I'm beginning to see how good science fiction calls our common sense interpretations into question. Yes, said the writer, I've got more. We've had the present in the future, but we can also do the past in the future. Keith Roberts' story, The God House, sounds like it's set in the Bronze Age. But by the time we get to this section, we already have the impression we're dealing with a post-apocalyptic world. Great, said the archaeologist. That would be an interesting way of writing experimentally or counterfactually about prehistory without having to make it historically accurate. Though, by the way, I'm really not sure about that cover. <laughs> I don't do pictures, said the writer, and it was the 70s. Let's move on. Another strategy of othering is in the writing itself. There's the alienation of normal language, as in Izigura's Never Let Me Go where the clones are described in medical and therapeutic terms as donors and carers. And by the way, that's a science fiction novel by a mainstream author, which itself adds to the, the sense of otherness in the text. And then we have the use of faux encyclopedias and glossaries, which appropriate the tropes of scientific writing to fiction to add very similitude to these other worlds. Think of all those tedious uh, chapter headings extracted from the Encyclopedia Galactica or whatever in June or Ursula Le Guin's Always Coming Home. Jameson calls her work the prototype of a utopian commitment to the countryside and the village. Gwyneth Jones described the book as a massive sedimentary deposit of appendices. <laughs> but, <laughs> however you see it, doesn't this type of approach call into question the authenticity of your reports? And here she is making visible that the problem of translation in a fictional context how does this factualized fiction differ from your fictionalized facts? And there's Harry Harrison's West of Eden, 
an alternate past novel where the dinosaurs never died out but evolved intelligence. And he uses the glossary at the end to give a, a rather nice sense of the difference between the conceptual and physical worlds of hunter-gatherer humans and the reptilians, showing how language creates worldviews. Some interesting kind of mirror images of our efforts to appropriate fiction in the service of science or history, said the archaeologist. So is that it? Because I'm just about out of time. One more thing, said the writer. Let's finish with Pamela Zolin's short story, The Heat Death of the Universe. It's a day in the life of a 60s housewife in its cosmological context. And the author said it was an attempt to make sense of general data by making analogies between entropy and personal chaos. I love the way the story presents the everyday as a series of fragments, summaries, hypotheses, and definitions finding all these unexpected connections and suggesting how small actions are part of a bigger picture. Isn't that basically what you do? I guess it is, said the archaeologist. And good to see that we have all these different ways of writing otherness, not just encounters with little green men. Really, it's about the unsettling of contemporary assumptions and readings, I suppose. Is that it, said the writer? Doesn't your paper need a proper conclusion? I think I'm going to end with the fragments, said the archaeologist. It's a good line, but I need to go away and think how to apply it. It looked as if the writer wanted to say something more, but no words came. The archaeologist went and put the kettle on, paying a bit more attention than usual to the boiling process. Outside, the traffic flowed steadily between the concrete buildings. Looking round, the writer appeared to have gone. All the archaeologist could see were the reflections in the mirror.